our shops. Uh, yeah. Or some yeah. Research. Whatever. Um, <laughs> it just seems like, like a hookup or something. Oh, I know. Like but a shop if you want to do it just just without a yeah. presentation, just a yeah. social dinner. Yeah. This would be down in California. Not so much here. Going to be there. He'd love to see you guys and connect and. You know, sponsor yeah, one of the I don't, I don't know that he has it. It's not my first uh, theory, so I shouldn't really say Actual non medical. Why don't you give me and write? You have his email address. This past weekend. Uh, yeah. Good morning. Good morning. How are, are you? Are we signing in every, every week now? Or? Um, yeah, and that's just, that's for the reps. Oh. Okay. So that they can account for the food. Okay. It's not for anything else, right. I don't think. I know it's not for anything else, I shouldn't say. I don't no, think. I know. It's right. You're our speaker this morning. I know, but I actually want to clear in time. There is it down to a small number. What a lot of yeah. But yeah. 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 yeah, I had a few of those too, and I just every year. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 Oh, my yeah. parents would do it. They would be yeah. Yeah. already so giving you that look. What do I say? And if you say surgery, they just give you that full of it. Sounds good. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah.
But in the other thing is down to the CDC, and he's in charge of infection control, for at least for Harperview, if not all the UW hospitals. He had to go for mandatory Ebola training. So uh, that's why we had a swap. So he's still going to be a presenter at the end of the year, I think May 5th. Now, the only other thing I want to know is with virtually all the fellows here, I, you guys are slow to respond to emails. Are you all going to the meeting this year? And all going to the Sunday dinner that I'm setting up. Yeah. Okay. I just getting close. I need an accurate head count. All right. So we have uh, Sydney's going to go first, and uh, we've got three speakers. If we get to all three, I'm not sure. But let's go ahead. Hi. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sydney Long. I'm one of the uh, first year allergy immunology fellows here at UW. 
To, today, um, my topic, I'm just going to briefly go over um, this uh, journal article about mast cell activation syndrome, essentially looking at some, um, a suggested new um, diagnostic and possibly treatment recommendations. So this article is called uh, Mast Cell Activation Syndrome, Improved Identification by Combined Determinations of Serum Tryptase and 24-Hour Urine 11 beta prostaglandin 2 alpha um, and this was uh, just recently published in the Journal of Allergen <coughs> Clinical Immunology in Practice um, last December. I have no um, disclosures. So we've heard um, excellent lectures about mastocytosis uh, and mass activation syndrome, but just to briefly review. Um, Mast cell activation syndrome is an idiopathic disorder of mast cell hyperreactivity. Patients usually present with recurrent symptoms of mast cell mediator release, and most common of those would include flushing, diarrhea, abdominal pain, pruritus, urticaria. These would be episodic. Um, and to be diagnosed with uh, mast cell activation syndrome, they also have to fail to meet the World Health Organization criteria for the diagnosis of systemic um, mastocytosis, and it's listed here in this chart, essentially divided into the major criteria, which is biopsy proven with multifocal dense infiltrates of mast cells, as well as um, minor criteria that are listed here, including CKIT mutation and as well as the serum tryptase level. And to qualify for the uh, diagnostic criteria, you have to have one major and one minor, or three uh, minor criteria to be um, to be diagnosed with systemic mastocytosis. Just one question on that. I thought that the tryptase level at one time was a lower level than that. Wasn't it 11.6 or something? Has it been redefined? This is what I got on the uh, American College. So no, the normal level is lower than 11.6, but to hit the diagnosis of mastocytosis, the cutoff's still 20. So 11.6 to 20 is kind of intermediate yeah. on diagnostic definition. Um, and here is a long list of some of the signs and symptoms patients can present with. As you can see, it uh, involves many organ systems of the body, including the skin, the heart, the lungs, and they're not very specific. Um, there's no single symptoms that are specific to the, to the syndrome, and um, it can be rather frustrating for both um, the patients and the uh, providers in kind of um, teasing out what is related to the mass cell activation versus just uh, like fatigue and faintness. So they're rather nonspecific. So um, coming up with more objective measurements of mass cell mediators to help with diagnosis um, is helpful. Here is the post proposed criteria for the diagnosis, and this was um, proposed in 2010. Essentially, um, the three main criteria, one, episodic symptoms consistent with mast cell mediator release affecting two organ systems or more. Um, and it's similar to what we, uh, what I just showed in the previous slide. Um, again, they're very nonspecific, involving skin, GI, cardiovascular, respiratory, even the nasal um, ocular systems. I mean, um, there's nausea and tachycardia, and I could probably meet this criteria right now. <laughs> Um, there's also a decrease, uh, the other second criteria would be a decrease in the symptoms or the severity or resolution of the symptoms with anti-mediator therapy, including um, antihistamines, anti-leukotrienes, and mast cell stabilizers. And then, um, and then the third criteria is to have an evidence of increase in some of the biomarkers of mast cell activation. And the most common ones that we use is, of course, the tryptase level. But there are other um, mediators um, as well that, that we can use that just haven't been done as much, um, including the 24-hour urine histamine metabolites um, or the prostaglandin D2 or its metabolite, the 11-beta um, prostaglandin F2. I'll call that. Um, PGF from now on. And then lastly, it's uh, mass activation um, syndrome is really a diagnosis of exclusion. So you really want to make sure to rule out um, other causes of mass activation. 
um, before giving the patient this diagnosis. So um, when mast cells are activated, they release both preformed and newly synthesized mediators. Um, this, this is just a table of some of the uh, uh, more common ones and the clinical features that they cause. Um, so you can see the, the histamine, tryptase, and the prostaglandin um, levels are here, or the mediators are listed here. And then, um, like I said, elevated tryptase level has been generally accepted as the biomarker, um, but um, and and within an episode, you wanna you wanna measure the level within 30 minutes to about four hours after an episode, which would make it most um, specific. Okay, and then the author of this paper that I'm gonna talk about um, also decided to look at the 24-hour urine methyl his, um, histamine, which is the metabolite of the histamine, as well as the 24-hour urine levels of the um, prostaglandin D2 metabolite. So this um, article um, look, is a retrospective study about 25 patients with mast cell activation syndrome at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester from 2006 to 2012. Um, they excluded patients obviously meeting criteria for systemic mastocytosis, um, and they did bone marrow biopsies on all these patients. Um, or these patients all had bone marrow biopsies that were negative um, for um, meeting the criteria for SM. Um, these patients had two or more organ systems that had recurrent or chronic symptoms of uh, mass activation, and also acute or chronic elevation in one or more of the mast cell mediator levels. So they um, looked at the baseline serum tryptase level, 24-hour urine, um, um, and methylhistamine, as well as the PGF levels um, in all these patients. And then in the, those patients with the elevated um, PGF urinary levels, they looked at the patients who received aspirin as part of their um, therapy, and then evaluated whether or not their um, subsequent levels were normalized, as well as whether they had symptomatic improvements on that. So here are the 25 patients they evaluated and their um, um, respective levels. Um, they rolled 11, or they looked at 11 women and they, um, 14 men, the average age was about 45. And um, so go back one slide. You said they checked their urine analysis for evidence for aspirin. Mm -hmm. What was that for? After 24 hours. Just to see, can we use this as a diagnosis for aspirin sensitivity now? Um, <coughs> no, they checked their urine <coughs> prostaglandin levels, um, and then they looked at the patients who were treated with aspirin um, for symptomatic relief of their, of their mass so activation syndrome. Yeah, they, they didn't measure their aspirin. Um, the clot prostaglandin yeah. production. Right. Butterfield, it does this. Or go back to their slide anyway to look at the numbers. There are a lot of tryptase levels there that are too low. Mm -hmm. What's the comment on that? Well, they're, they're, they meet, they either have elevations in one of the three mediators, not just the tryptase. All right, so you don't, all right. Um, so, the, the, of the patients, the baseline tryptase level was elevated for about 10 of the 25 patients, above 11.5, 11 um, 11 and the and, um, methylhistamine was elevated for only two of the patients, both of which were women. Um, and then lastly, the PGF-2 um, alpha was elevated for 17 of those patients. And you can see in this table, um, the the number of patients um, in which these levels were elevated. They also broke it down into symptoms um, and who were more likely to have, you know, which elevations um, based on the symptoms. For example, in patients who complained of flushing, 100% of those patients had elevations in their tryptase level, whereas only 82% of those patients had elevation in their prostaglandin um, levels, which is kind of interesting. So then they took the 17 patients um, with the elevated prostaglandin level. Um, they found out nine of them had been recommended to initiate aspirin therapy. 
uh, with dose ranging from 81 milligrams daily to 500 milligrams twice daily. And then um, they were able to, um, then these patients also had subsequent urine uh, prostaglandin levels checked. Um, they were able to compare pre-treatment um, and then post-treatment, essentially, while they're on the aspirin, um, whether their levels decreased. And of these nine patients, seven of them had normalization of their 24-hour urine prostaglandin level. And then seven patients had symptomatic improvement. And this was uh, evaluated by asking the patients whether their symptoms improved, essentially. Um, the interesting thing to note is that the seven patients that normalized didn't, didn't match exactly with the seven patients that had symptomatic improvement. Um, so, for example, this patient didn't have um, normalization, but also did have symptomatic improvement. And then um, this patient had normalization, but did not have symptomatic improvement. <coughs> So that was um, just kind of a brief, small um, study evaluating 25 patients um, and raising the question as to whether urinary excretion of the PGF-2 alpha um, would be a good, good marker to use, because currently, obviously, it's not being used as much as tryptase, whether it's due to um, ease of collection or, you know, um, knowledge of it. Um, so, in this study, they actually found that those patients who met criteria for the um, mass activation syndrome, more of them had elevations of the 24-hour urinary um, PGF level than the, uh, and the majority of them had it, uh, as opposed to just elevation of the tryptase level alone. And then, um, maybe considering using a combination of both serum tryptase level as well as the PGF um, urinary levels to to aid in patients who are not as, um, as clear-cut. So, I mean, in uh, the aim of therapy for mass activation syndrome is really to block the synthesis of release or end organ effects of the mast cell mediators, um, symptomatic treatment with um, H1H2 antihistamines, catodophin, anticholinergics, aspirin, Etc. The aspirin it inhibits the um, Cox enzymes that's needed for the production of the PGD2, um, and that's responsible for a lot of the symptoms of um, mass activation syndrome. So, with that you know, mechanism in mind, you can consider that in patients with um, symptomatic uh, MCAS and elevated um, prostaglandin levels. Um, addition of aspirin to a failed or partially effective regimen of antihistamines and other uh, mast cell mediated inhibitors can be considered. So if they're not being controlled on the H1 and H2 antihistamines and they have elevated um, PGF urinary levels, um, aspirin um, might be helpful in those patients. Um, of course, there are limitations to, um, to this study. One of them is, of course, the retrospective nature of this study. There wasn't any um, set parameters for aspirin therapy other than them having an elevation, and it's just say like 24. I don't know where 23 came from. Um, and um, aspirin therapy was very provider dependent. There was no, you know, it's just who was comfortable using it and who has had experience using it. Um, and it, they found that it was generally used for prevention of flushing and hypotension symptoms. Um, so this is just a brief summary slide. Um, so we started out um, knowing that mast cell activation syndrome is a newly recognized disorder with systemic clinical and laboratory manifestations of mast cell mediator release. Um, perhaps this article has helped us to see that in addition to elevated tryptase level, um, we can consider using a 24-hour urine um, prostaglandin level to characterize patients. And then with this in mind, consideration of aspirin um, for use in patients who are not, whose symptoms are not well controlled if they do have evidence of this um, elevated level. Okay. Is the timing important as it is with tryptase? When do you have to start the urine collection relevant to the symptoms? Um, I'm not sure. They didn't mention that in the article, but it was a um, baseline level that they were checking for everybody. They weren't doing it during symptomatic period? Mm -hmm. okay. 
Drew, do you have any experience here? Or are we doing? I don't use it. I I know this group at Mayo. Maybe Erin can comment on that if she thought. But yeah. they they love that marker. I've had three we or four people. For everyone that came in with potential mass testing. And I know Butterfield will treat with aspirin until it gets set below a certain level. You know, I I've never done it in my reading. There's much more variability with the prostaglandins as opposed to the triptase. The triptase is amazingly consistent if you follow people. You know, it's always within a point one or point two in my experience and. and I'm mainly looking for an elevation in the setting of an episode. So I, I admit I don't use this uh, from this article. I might use it if someone has a lot of flushing or something like that, but we sent uh, I don't. Home with like a urine kit so that if they were to have another episode, then they could check it then as well. So they would start the urine collection. So after these are random values. If they're elevated at any time in, in a patient's course, even between, they don't say, they're not specific. Mm -hmm. Makes it look better than trip days. The way they spin the data. <laughs> no comment. Sydney's <laughs> our new expert. I think because so they these patients met criteria for mast cell activation syndrome because they had elevations in one of those three. I think it's I think it's difficult to interpret because they, you know, they had elevations in the urinary level but no elevation in the triptase level, they still called it mass cell activation syndrome. Um, you, know, you know what I mean? Like it's... And 81 milligrams of aspirin, seems like some of them on, are pretty benign medication. So I put somebody empirically, just without checking levels, and just to see if there was any sort of benefit. Yeah, yeah we use a lot of aspirin, yeah. but I don't get these levels to follow it and titrate yeah. it based on those levels. All right. give a talk uh, about rapid drug desensitization. This is something that's coming up more and more, especially as we're starting to change some protocols over at the, um, the University of Washington as well as at Seattle Children's. And I wanted to go over this paper that was discussing kind of the latest, greatest stuff about the mechanism of this. So I have no conflicts. Uh, the goal of this talk is to define type 1 hypersensitivities, to find the principles of rapid drug desensitization, and to find the possible mechanism of rapid drug sensitization. So uh, everybody knows this slide, type 1 hypersensitivities. We have uh, an allergen exposure leading to sensitization of, anti of IgE to this, which then binds to the FC receptor on, um, on sensitized cells, leading to the release of these mast cells or basophils to cause many different effects, all of which Sydney just talked about. Um, much more complicated slide. I just wanted to spend most of the time talking about this and just pointing out this receptor right here, the, the um, high affinity FC epsilon R1 receptor that we'll be talking about in a little bit more detail coming up in a little bit in regards to as a possible mechanism of what happens with rapid drug desensitization. I won't labor the fine mechanistic points coming forward. Um, here are some of the um, Various different preformed granules and everything we just talked about histamine, uh, tryptase, carb carboxypeptidase, among others. Um, I'll talk about something that's because this is an animal model that, that this group used, some of the specifics that are a little bit different in mouse. And many, many cytokines and other immunomodulatory agents that are released as well. So, what is rapid drug desensitization? The principle is to take extremely low doses of the offending drug or antigen and increase it incrementally until you reach the drug of choice. This is different than uh, immunotherapy, which is done over the period of weeks, months, to years. This is done usually over the course of hours to a day, two, okay? It's something we commonly do in the hospital or in clinic with various agents, but we really don't know why or how this works. Um, so this uh, paper um, from um, Jackie came out in about 2013, and it was a group out of Stanford looking um, to see how we could understand better how this rapid desensitization works, and they used uh, a mouse model. Um, so they used black six mice as in vivo experiments, and they used mouse peritoneal mast cells for their in vitro work. The reason they used peritoneal mast cells as opposed to peripheral mast cells in the blood is just easier to get in a mouse, and that was the explanation of those. 
So the sensitization process, so this is a little bit different. So this is experimental as opposed to kind of the natural way that we get exposed to it. So the mouse were injected with specific IgE to sensitize them to an antigen. And how um, kind of conventionally it's done, they use two different um, sensitization agents. So they use anti-2,4-diphenyl, or DNP, that's how we're going to abbreviate it, IgE, and anti ova albumin, or just ova. Uh, IgE and they inject these into the mouse to sensitize them. Usually it's like a day or two prior to this and then they also do this for the incubation prior for the mast cell um, cell cultures. Um, and then to challenge them they were they are then injected with DMP serum human albumin or ova albumin as their antigen or both. Um, mouse anaphylaxis is a, is a little bit different than human anaphylaxis. Um, various endpoints were measured um, but in the in vivo model, it's hypothermia. That's one of the biggest presentations of how, how mice present with anaphylaxis. And then um, in mast cell degranulation, they look at a couple different things, but primarily it's beta hexoaminidase, aminidase, which is uh, something that's released by um, mouse mast cells, as well as histamine and PGT2. But primarily beta hexoaminidase is what they used. Okay. So this very complicated slide is one of many, many complicated slides they have here. I've never seen so many figure ones with A, B, C, D, E, F with in, in the paper like this. So essentially what we're looking at is a dose response curve, all right? Um, so we have the white one here is just saline, so injected saline. And then uh, these are all sensitized mouse to, um, to anti-DNP and then increasing doses of DNP over time. Um, so for each of these different mice, so it's basically a dose response, all right? So higher doses, dramatic drop in body temperature. So this is temperature drop, and then over time. Um, and so this was just to figure out a dose to get a good response without actually killing the animal. Okay. So rapid drug desensitization uh, is an appropriately sensitized mouse. Um, the antigen was infused at gradually increasing doses every 30 minutes, ultimately to, uh, to get to the challenge dose itself. So here we are. Um, so the white circles are our controls. So just injection of saline. Um, our black ones are the uh, non-desensitized ones, and our red ones are our desensitized ones. And here's the doses that kind of incrementally desensitize these animals too. And then the challenge dose is up 1.5 milligrams per kilo of, uh, of the human albumin. And we can see that um, the white ones, of course, don't do anything. <coughs> the black ones are the ones that have not been desensitized, and they get their challenge dose in a significant drop in their body temperature. And the ones that have been desensitized, um, we see that if nothing happens. So our model works. You just understand this model. They're passively sensitized with IgE, right? Yes. They don't make the natural they IgE don't. response. Yes, so it's not a natural IgE Then response. you inject the antigen uh, and they get a reaction. Exactly. But if you give them small incremental doses at 30 minute intervals, you protect them. Yes. Right. Yeah, so that's the basic principle of desensitization for, that we use in human beings too. Um, here's another way of looking at it. So this is looking, these are uh, out, this is our uh, in vitro model. So like I told you, beta hexoamandase is something that's released by mast cells. Uh, again, one of the many complicated slides that they have. Um, here we have um, no desensitization and, and desensitization, and this is just um, with no significance to the, ex to the exposure, all right? So here, and they're just measuring baseline levels here. So these are the, uh, desensitized mice, and these are the not desensitized mice. All right. We have the desensitized with without the challenge, and then no desense with the challenge. Bang, big time, big time uh, release of these of these granules, and then we have the DMP desensitized with the challenge. So we see that there's definitely a significant difference between these two. Okay. So both at the in vitro and in vivo model, we see that the desensitization protocol that they used was effective. Um, here it is, same thing, but with histamine instead. We can see here a uh, similar type of thing, uh, no descents uh, with the challenge, and then DMP desensitization with, with challenge, and we can see that there's significant difference, and then the prostaglandin, similar type of thing. Okay, so how did this work? We know that this works. We've seen this. We do this to patients in the hospital, but 
how does this work? So there's many different hypotheses um, to this, and we'll talk about each one. Um, first, uh, is this truly mediated through the mast cells and basophils? Is desensitization? Is our mast cells and basophils necessary for this? Um, is this works through a depletion of chemical mediators? Are we slowly, timely depleting our, our mast cells? Is there an alteration to the signal cascade? And is there internalization, maybe, of the F that common FC receptor to these antigen complexes? We'll talk about each one in somewhat detail. Okay, so pi hypothesis one. Are mast cells critical for drug sensitization and desensitization? So a nice elegant way of looking at this is to say, all right, let's take a mouse who doesn't have mast cells. And so there is a the knockout mouse with no mast cells. And that's the, uh, the kit, WWSH. These are uh, animals that do not have mast cells. And what happens when you kind of do this transensitization? Um, again, back to the messy slide. Um, these little triangles are actually the um, the uh, the kit mutation mice. So these are the guys that don't have any sort of uh, mast cells in them, and you can kind of see that nothing happens. So they do not become sensitized um, to it. So mast cells are necessary for for um, for these mice to have a sort of a systemic response. Like I said, these slides are these little. There's like four or five of these per figure, and they're a ton of information per for each one. Um, here we go, looking at in vitro, uh, we can see um, that with, um, these are mast cells, and no descents with no challenge, descents with the challenge, and then uh, desensitization and the challenge. We can see that there's no, we can see the degranulation here as expected and the lack of degranulation here. So we can see mast cells are definitely necessary. Uh, hypothesis two, uh, rapid drug desensitization works via granule depletion of mediators in mast cells or basophil granules. Um, if this were true, then rapid desensitization of any antigen would make you desensitized to all antigens. So if you, we desensitized you to, if you're allergic to penicillin and we desensitized you to penicillin, you're also allergic to um, uh, Bactrim, then we could give you Bactrim after we desensitize you without a problem. So, how can we do this? Well, let's take a mouse who's sensitized to both the DMP and to the OVA, desensitize them to the DMP, and then challenge them with the OVA. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's exactly what they did. So, um, this is all in vitro work looking at beta hexanamidase and the percentage. Okay, so we can see here is what they were desensitized. Here's what they were desensitized to. So this is the this this set of data is the DMP desensitized, okay? And this is the um, and so this one's DMP desensitized and this is OVA desensitized. And this is what they challenged with. So here in the DMP group, so they desensitized the DMP as expected, no response. Here is the OVA desensitized. Give them DMP, same as same as the undesensitized mouse. So. Um, DMP desensitization has no effect on their sensitivity to OVA. And the same goes for the opposite way for OVA. So in this mouse who is DNP desensitized, we give them exposed to OVA, same as the undesensitized mouse. Okay? So rapid desensitization did not deplete the mast cell chemical mediators. Um, and so it seems to work through a very specific antigen specific antigen mechanism. So it's not that we just kind of de desensitize the entire body, the entire system. We are doing this to, a very, to the drug-specific agent. Um, let me see. I don't want to talk about that. So the um, next thing I want to talk about is the internalization of the FC receptor. Um, so could um, this be the way it specifically works? Could cross-linked antigen IgE and the FT receptor bind the, that binds the mast cell internalize so it's no longer there <coughs> as the potential mechanism of how rapid drug desensitization works? All right, so here is uh, in vitro using uh, confocal microscopy. And we have our different states here. If you turn, how do I turn off the lights? Let's see the pretty pictures. Okay. This is an aside. Based yes. on hypothesis two, this is the only way. 
I think so too. Um, but there's actually controversy. So, um, so here we have no desensitization. Okay, and this is looking at um, anti-DMP IgE. Okay, and so um, so this is um, uh, chemically labeled. So the IgE we can see here in the non-desensitized ones that it's all kind of on the surface of the cell. All right, and here we have the DMP desensitized one, and it looks okay. Uh, it's much better on my screen. Um, all of it is, most of it is all internalized into the cell itself. And you can see here three different cells. And then um, after the challenge, we see internalization of these receptors. And then uh, after the challenge with the desensitized ones, we see no real change between these two um, cells. Um, this is an interesting uh, cell. This is looking at the uh, anti, um, looking at the IgE on the kind of the surface receptors as well as kind of beta hexadamidase um, uh, release in relation to the increasing doses of DMP as they do desensitized to it. Okay, so in this very very messy slide, as we th as we're going this way, we're increasing the dose of, th of the desensitization. All right. And then we're looking at the, uh, the anti-IgE um, uh, uh, on the cell surface, right? So as we increase, let's see, where's my pointer? As we increase the dose, we see the slow, gradual internalization of the of this common uh, FC receptor with the bound antigen, and then here is uh, the non-desensitized one who still responds to it. Okay. And this is, um, and these last ones are after the desensitization, after the challenge has occurred. Okay, so there's this definitely slow process. There's definitely a, a tipping point where the, um, like, if you go too fast, you you might uh, actually trip this off. And they did experiments that I'm not going to show where they did a different types of stepwise response to see if they could prevent the. Um, to see if there was uh, any difference between if they did it twofold, threefold, tenfold. And at the tenfold rate, they actually did see a release of mass, they did degranulate. So it, there's a very specific rate that you can do this at. And interestingly to note, the current standard of practice at UW as well as Children's is a tenfold increase in desensitization. Um, and that we're trying to change currently. Is that a top panel actually measuring internalization or just a surface. on the surface? Surface. It's measuring surface. How about the other parameter, Dan? Like, in other words, time frame as oh. far as how quickly to go oh. to the next dose. No, they, they didn't look at the difference in time frames. But most, most of these guys do between 15 to 30 minutes is kind of the, kind of the window, similar to what we kind of do um, uh, kind of clinically. Okay. So internalization of this common FC receptor, um, there, there still is controversy re regarding this. Um, a very nice paper out of, out of the Brigham um, with, um, with Castles just the year before this showed that there was no internalization of, the, uh, of, this, of this complex. Um, they showed actually a very, very different. So two papers within a year of each other showed completely different <laughs> mechanistic uh, characteristics of what's happening here. Um, I think there's a problem with the Castles paper is that they use bone marrow derived mast cells that were as, as kind of as artificial as you can get because they had to be kept in a certain type of interleukin environment. Um, whereas the, these other, these other guys, uh, the Stanford paper used, you know, fully mature peritonea mast cells and they also used, they had a nice in vivo model that, that, that demonstrated this as well. Um, but it's not completely understood. So what is the mechanism causing this internalization without activation of mast cell? Um, there's some speculation that it's through impaired STAT6 and P38 phosphorylation. Um, and in the Castles paper, they found that in the STAT6 knockout mice, that these mice could not be desensitized. In this paper, they desensitized STAT6 without any problems. So like I said, we don't know exactly how this works, but um, the trouble though is if it, if it was a transcription mechanism, it wouldn't be antigen. Exactly, and 
Yeah, so if it, if it was, if it's related to some sort of phosphorization, you would imagine it would not be specific to an exa antigen, exactly how you're thinking, Dr. Allman. So I, th I truly think that it has to do with this internalization. It has to be an antigen-specific mechanism that is not involved with some sort of um, phosphorization change in kind of in transcription factor because it happens so quickly. We can do this over like a few hour period. You're not gonna see changes that quickly. And so there's something that happens at this cell to cell surface marker level that's really, that's what's occurring. So my conclusions are this, um, that rapid drug desensitization works via an antigen specific mechanism via internalization of the common FC receptor based on kind of what um, the preponderance of evidence as well as what in, in actually internalize, internalize makes sense to me. Yes. When you have passive sensitization where you inject the IgE, does that have a different response than if they're naturally sensitized? It's a very good question, um, but it's just the experimental model that they used. So um, how long it, do they stay sensitized when you passively sensitize them? Oh, I don't know that off, off the top of my head. That's a, that's a good question. I, I know they, they do this relatively quickly after they, they sensitize them, so it's not that they do this after months and months and months. Mm -hmm. But in humans, if you desensitizing the penicillin, it's just temporary. Well, temporary. The but sensitizing. Right. So sensitizing them. I was wondering if we gave you yeah. IgE to penicillin, how long would that be in your system? Yeah. Ten days. Ten days. Ten days. Ten days. So if it binds to the mast cell, is that protected, or is it still going in ten days? Well, maybe we'll sensitize them. Yeah. It's just sort of an artificial system, and you wonder why they didn't just sensitize the mast cells themselves instead of injecting the other it's, stuff. It's, it's hard to control for that, and so this is kind of the the current modeling. Um, so all the you know they do this in mice, they do this in rats, they do this in various. It's the current, and they do this in vitro. So a lot of the work in vitro, this is kind of the way you have to do it. And so they use the, so they could do both in vivo and in vitro models at the same time, do the same stuff. So you can see the same effect. And that's kind of why they do it this way. Um, it would be interesting if we could do this with human cells too, um, if we can extract human cells. Uh, there's, lots of, there's lots of work to do. So we're at the very beginning. So while, while rapid desensitization is definitely old and it's not new, uh, us understanding why it works and how it works is definitely, uh, we're starting to have a better idea. So before this paper, there was, you know, there was some thoughts about this, but I think this is the most elegant paper in the last 10 years that, that kind of showed how our mechanism works. I don't think you mean, is that your conclusion? Or That's my your... conclusion, and their conclusion as well. That's the title of their paper. But, um, they use the word common. I wouldn't call it common. I'd say antigen specific. Oh. Yeah. yeah. It's just nitpicking, but. No, that's the common. No, well, it's the no, that's the receptor, the common receptor. So it's the IgE that's the specific. Yeah. Oh, you're just using it to. Yeah. So that's the that's the, the common F the FC receptor is the it's where the IgE binds and that's what's the specific. Yeah. Anybody try passively sensitizing them, then giving them Zolaire and then trying this? Yes. So there there was there's all sorts of. This paper also kind of goes off on the anti-IgE stuff. They didn't use Zolaire, but they used the, the mouse equivalent to it. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's complicated in what they, what they had. So there's, there's lots of problems with the model itself when they start to do this kind of thing. Um, so um, it, if, you want to read the, if you read the paper, you can kind of get into it. But there's lots of supplemental data that um, I couldn't really understand. They, they got... One of the problems with this paper is they got in, got in front of themselves in terms of how complicated they got uh, towards the end. So it wasn't very clear on what they were doing because there were some quirks in the model of the DNP model. And uh, because uh, the anti-IgE seemed to um, kind of stimulate some things as well um, and kind of cross-link certain things, so it wasn't perfect. So I, I can't answer your question for you, I'm sorry. But, uh, it's, um, but they did try things like that, yeah. Can you get a rebound effect, some kind of rebound effect after that? I mean, if, I don't know if the mast cell act also as uh, ACCs, they can internalize the antigen, process it, present it again, and then you develop new allergies, the different habitats of the same protein. Yeah, I mean, very well could. Rebound effect, I yeah, I, I don't think they looked at it over, over that type of time period. Yeah. I'm going. I'm going to, I'm going to, I have 15 minutes. Okay. okay. <laughs> Mary's got laryngitis. I have terrible laryngitis, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay.
e-cigarettes. Yeah, I'm doing mine on e-cigarettes because it is in the news. You've been smoking and that's why you sound like you. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Okay, so uh, e-cigarettes were invented in the early 2000s by a Chinese pharmacist and it was his way of trying to figure out a non-combustible uh, nicotine because his father was dying of lung cancer, he wanted to come up with a better a better way. So it was invented in 2003. It entered the U.S. market in 2007. It's in a two and a half billion dollar industry. There are 250 companies that produce e-cigarette models. And just so you know, blue e-cigs are the best-selling brand here in the United States. And it's interesting. My husband's in insurance, but he does corporate insurance. The um, the blue. I think this company came to him asking for um, like underwriter insurance and the biggest thing that they were saying is that the flavors are made in the US. That was a big deal because it's a US made, even though all the components are made in China, um, because it's a US company. Okay. So um, what is the basic e-cigarette design? There's a lithium battery attached to a heating element, which is the atomizer and it vaporizes a nicotine solution. And this vaporization allows for inhalation of the vapor and produces an aerosol similar in appearance to conventional cigarettes. So your mouth goes where it says vapor, right here. Um, and then the little light at the end, you know, when you see kids on campus, they all have like the blue lights. Okay, well that's, that's sim simulating the burning. Um, there are three types of um, e-cigarettes. There's the cig alike, which is the ones that were the original, it's like the type one or whatever, it resembles the cigarettes. They're the egos, I don't even know what that stands for, but it's it's got a bigger tank, it can be refilled with the juice, and they oftentimes can heat at higher elements or at a higher temperature. And then the mods are where they just take the basic components and these can be used like for smoking marijuana. And they're single use and reusable devices. And then most of them are made in China. Um, okay, the e-cigarette liquid. First of all, it contains nicotine. It contains, there. you can add flavorant chemicals. There are more than 7,500 different flavors and I'm giving you all the different ranges. And let me tell you, I don't think very many adults are gonna be going for a gummy bear or bubble gum. And then the other component is propylene glycol or glycerol. And um, if you can see, there's pina colada, there's peach schnapps, all different kinds of flavors. How much nicotine does an e-cigarette contain? A typical cigarette can hold up to three milliliters of the liquid nicotine, and the, it can range from six to 24 milligrams per ml. And one e-cigarette contain, contains um, 18 to 72 milligrams of nicotine compared to one tobacco cigarette. Now the thing I don't know is when you fill up your e-cigarette with this nicotine solution, how long does it last? Like how many puffs do you take? Do you take, you know, I think they say like 15 puffs is the same as when is one cigarette, but then I don't know how long your e-cigarette will last you. I, I, I didn't ever see that. Um, propylene glycol, the other component in the um, in the e-cigarette liquid, is is actually um, the stuff that they use for theater mist machines. So it's a pretty safe compound. It's a co um, a food and cosmetic additive, and it's also used as antifreeze. And sometimes they use glycerol in place of the propylene glycol, or it can be mixed with the propylene glycol to make it more to withstand higher vaporization pressures or temperatures. Okay, so here's the e-cigarette conundrum. For e-cigarettes, for people who are older entrenched smokers, it may help them quit or cut back on their smoking. However, for kids who aren't currently smokers, it may introduce them to the world of nicotine and re-legitimize re tobacco use in society. So there was a Cochrane review done um, this past year, and the purpose was really looking at do e-cigarettes help smokers stop or cut down on their smoking? Of all, I think they reviewed I can't remember. It's a crazy number of studies, but really there's very limited data. Um, they looked at 13, eventually they narrowed it down. There were 13 completed studies. There were only two randomized control studies, and it should say involved about 900 plus patients, and they showed that e-cigarettes reduced the amount that people smoke by about a half, but they couldn't determine if e-cigarettes were better than a nicotine patch. And then looking at one of those studies a little bit more closely, this was one where these, these are smokers who want to quit smoking. And they took 650 smokers and they um, were assigned to three different pathways. Either they got the e-cigarette at 16 milligrams, they got a nicotine-free e-cigarette, or they got the nicotine patches. And at six months follow-up, follow they looked to make sure that they weren't smoking biochemically, 
And if you look at their cessation efforts, I mean, it's, it's not great. And then this is the Kaplan-Meier analysis of time to relapse. So achievement of abstinence was substantially lower than expected and um, insufficient statistical power to conclude superiority of nicotine e-cigarettes to patches or, over placebo. Okay, not great. Okay, so this was just last week. Big New England article, um, I was right, listening in my car, NPR, uh, interviewed, these, these are Portland State, I think chemists, um, they were looking at, so the thing about e-cigarettes is supposedly they're, le they're, they're healthier because you're not having all the carcinogens in them. It's just the nicotine and the propylene glycol and you're getting rid of all that combustible stuff. Um, and these guys looked at formaldehyde, and it's the degradation product of propylene glycol and glycerol during vaporization. And as you know, formaldehyde is a group one carcinogen. And it's found in cigarettes at about 150 micrograms per cigarette or three milligrams per pack of 20 cigarettes. And they noted that when, these, when you look at e-cigarettes, especially with the, with the tank-like cigarettes, um, especially because they can get to higher temperatures, they can vaporize and form large amounts of hidden formaldehyde, which are called the hemiacetals, and it's five to 15 times higher than the amount in the traditional cigarettes. So here's their, the, so although they proclaim that they're healthier, may not be so great. And then um, the use of e-cigarettes has surpassed tobacco cigarettes in U.S. teens. And every year since 1975, my kids, your kids, fill out these surveys about how much alcohol they drink in the last 30 days, how much smoking they do, how much drugs they use. And, um, the, and they looked at, in 2014, it was the first year that they ever attained data on e-cigarette use. And the use of alcohol, cigarettes, and illicit drug use fell among U.S. teens, but the use of e-cigarettes has gone up. <clears throat> or at least they're, they're monitoring it. What age is it legal to sell this product? Oh, I'm getting there. Okay, teens perceive e-cigarettes as healthier. If you ask eighth graders, 62% of them say that cigarettes are bad, but only 15% of them view e-cigarettes as being bad or harmful. Um, the question is, are e-cigarettes um, an entry for teens to use nicotine, and is it a gateway for them to become long-term adult smokers? The regulatory status in the U.S. is, um, is um, uh, e-cigarettes are not subject to U.S. tobacco laws because they do not contain tobacco. Um, in April 2014, the FDA proposed some rules for e-cigarettes to make them the minimum age 18, require an ID for purchase, don't sell them in vending machines, prohibit manufacturers from providing free samples, and mandate warning labels. So all of this was proposed a, like April last year. Um, they have about a year to put this into place. So right now, there's really not very much regulation. Okay, it's kind of statewide. Half of the states have taken initiative to regulate e-cigarettes in the absence of federal regulation. Um, just last, last week, um, our attorney general wants to make Washington the first state in the country where no one under 21 can buy tobacco. Um, there are four states plus Washington, Washington DC that require tobacco users to be greater than 19. So if you have an 18 year old, which I do, he on his 18th birthday can go buy himself an e-cigarette, which of course my son did. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he waited about a month. And of course, uh, being the snoopy mother that I am, I just happened to see this receipt in his wallet. For whatever reason, I can't even tell you why I was in his wallet. And it was a $200 receipt for this thing at this vape shop over on the Utah District. And so, you know, I said to him, Matt, why, why, do you have a, why did you spend $200 at a vape shop? Right? And then he shows it to me, and, you know, it's like, dude and so the next day of course my husband and matt went and took the thing back but he had taken it out of the plastic but the guy did take it back he hadn't used it thank god so i feel like i dodged the bullet by being a snoop and i, I admit it <laughs> um this is the I, I have this uncanny sense with my children um and this is the current geographic distribution of e-cigarette um clean air regulations so if it's a red state it's really banned 100 percent Workplace, restaurants, bars, you can't have, you can't be smoking indoors. So King County. Um, what about regulatory status in other countries? EU um, bans advertising of e-cigarettes and bans nicotine flavoring. And there are many, there are several countries that ban e-cigarettes entirely. Canada. Okay, so big tobacco. I, okay, so I had to look at this. Okay, so Philip Morris is really called Altria. And it, owns, it has 50% of the market share, and it sells Marlboro, which is the number one selling brand of um, cigarettes. 
The RJ Reynolds is about 26%, and you can see the list of what they, um, uh, with cigarettes and devices they, or whatever, tobacco products they sell. And then Loriard is a um, third, and then fourth is Imperial Tobacco. And Newport is the number two selling brand in the United States, and especially popular among African Americans. They also are the ones that own the blue e-cigs. Okay, so Altria, this huge parent company, it includes Felt Morris, which has the Marlboro. It's got the smokeless tobacco. It's got Newmark, which is Mark 10 as their e-vapor product. They sell cigars. And then did you know they own St. Michelle Lights? Uh, yeah, okay. It's their money laundering service. Yeah, exactly. So when we were out for dinner this last week, my, the, the menu, there's all these shit. Michelle, St. Michelle wines. I told my husband, I'm like, I'm not ordering those anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I always liked them, but no more. Okay. Uh, in two days, tomorrow, maybe tomorrow, there's going to be this huge merger. Um, and it's going to unite Reynolds American, which is the number two company, with Loriard, which is the number three company, to now create a stronger number two company to challenge the Altria group. And then with this, because then they're going to own 80% of the market or 88% of the market, the Reynolds American and, and the Loriard are going to spin off some of their products. So Imperial Tobacco, which is a European company, is going to get e-cigs, the blue e-cigs, and then some of these other brands to head off regulatory concerns about competition. Okay, so you'll, you guys know tomorrow. All right, and then the last thing is, um, I think this is on Friday on the news. See, this is all in the news. Um, there are cases, okay, so the, the lithium batteries. There are cases of people who are using their e-cigarettes that the lithium battery explodes and they get burns, okay? So last Friday, the FAA now is warning airlines about the risk of fires caused by e-cigarettes. So you put them in your suitcase and then somehow they get turned on and uh, then they catch fire. So there have been two incidents in the last couple months. There was an overheated e-cigarette sparked a fire at LA International last month, and then at Boston Logan Airport, an e-cigarette in a bag caught fire in the cargo hold of a plane forcing an evacuation. And that was before they took off. Okay, so here's my summary. E-cigarettes have the potential to reduce the toll of tobacco harm, but are also risk undermining our progress in tobacco control, especially with teens, and they can hardly be considered harmless. Okay. There you go. Thank you, Mary. Everything. A couple comments. There was a very interesting article in a New York Times that was about a month ago. And what's relevant about it is 92% of the liquid actually comes from China, not the U.S. Yes. What's relevant about that is a very high percentage of heavy metal contamination. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Who knows if that really gets in your airway? And then yeah. the second thing is AAP just came out with a position statement, uh, obviously. Yeah. Uh, against it. Yes. Yeah, yesterday. Yeah. Okay, yesterday. Okay, I didn't look yesterday. Yes. Did you read any of this stuff about the kids getting into the vapor crap and getting toxic? Okay, so poison? yes, wa there was um, the Washington Poison. So that's the other thing is that uh, the Washington Poison Control, the number of cases of kids just drinking the liquid oh, wow. is has gone up from like 10 cases to like 200 in some cases just in the last year. And especially because it tastes, you know, if, especially if it's got the flavoring in there. You know, so yeah, kids are getting um, sick from just drinking the, the actual liquid, like the parents leaving their vaporizing the liquid around. So it's popular in China, you know? Uh, I would assume so. I mean, it's a, it's, yeah, I don't know. smoke marijuana in China. I mean, cigarettes are tremendous in China. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. That's right. So there you go. Are these cheaper than cigarettes? They are a little cheaper than cigarettes. Pretty much vaporizing that you buy. What is the cost? $10 a pack. $7.50. I won't sell it. They used to be like 30 cents a pack. Yeah, I was very young. It is nice not seeing the ads on TV. I missed the Marvel, man. That was sort of cool. Cancer ridden guy. Or the Virginia Slim. That's right. I like to put long. Only one cigarette. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think it is. You should make a mirror like.